All right, YouTube says I'm live, so um, let's hope that actually that's actually the case. As usual, if something is wrong or something with the sound or the video or whatever, let me know, uh, and I'll try and fix it. But for now, let's just get started and uh, see what what happens. Turn off my sound here for a sec. Should be okay. All right. So, welcome everyone. Um, yeah. Let's see uh, what we can do for this one. Um, I have a couple of the renders that are in the thumbnail that I want to show you guys. And uh, the first two, like the faces, I don't know if I'll have time to show all of them. I'll definitely show the two that um, are in the thumbnail because I think those two have the more interesting techniques in them. And um, then that Void Linux logo that I did recently as well, I'll uh, show as well. So with that, let's get straight into it. Um, I've been doing all this stuff in Blender 2.8. I shouldn't because it's not working properly and blah, 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 but you know, whatever. Um, my UI is a little bit different. So if that's really too much of a pain in the butt, tell me and I'll try and move it around. But what I'll do for now is actually move myself over here. And then that way we can get started and there's nothing in the way of the modifier stack over here. So. Here we go. So this is the first one. Um, maybe I'll show the final image first, just to get an idea as a reference. I think it's this version. So this is the um, first one that I did in this series. And um, the goal here was just sort of experiment, have fun, and um, yeah, see how much I can destroy a mesh before it becomes completely unreadable, and then just kind of pull it back a little bit from there. Um, so before I show you the Blender thing, if there's one thing I learned from this, very quick, very easy, keep the eyes intact. And honestly, you can go pretty crazy with everything else. And really, it was pretty, uh, uh, pretty insane to see, you know, if you keep this, it reads like a human almost immediately at any size. So that was fun to see. And um, just for the people that might be interested, let's see where are the full on versions. I think it's this one because it's taking a second to load. I don't know. Yeah, I did two colors of this one. I couldn't really decide which one I liked better. There you go. But just to give you an idea of the actual size, I do usually render these very big. So you can see some of the detail and some of the stuff that's really gone horribly wrong. And there's some noise in there still, but you know, if you've been watching my stuff for a while, then a little bit of noise, I don't mind too much. It gets interesting. But just to give you an idea of the amount of detail that's in there, um, maybe I'll do, I'll show all of them because it's quite interesting. Like this one as well. I just love the pattern that this was giving and it's all sort of over the top and the, um, the wireframe is kind of pushing out more than it even should, but did a lot of stuff with subsurface scattering on this one, was enjoying myself with that. So some a lot of cool things in 2.8 that I'm very happy are in there now. And uh, yeah, it's always a good thing. Let's have a look at this one as well. So here you see, this is one, one of the techniques I wanted to show you guys as well, um, where you get like this really interesting pattern um, that's sort of like messed up and isn't and yet different. Uh, without really having to do much work, I sort of stumbled upon it as I do with all these things. Um, let's have a quick look at this one as well. So here you see that same sort of idea, that same sort of trick coming back. And I really like this. I thought this was a very, very interesting look. So yeah, I should really print more of these. Um, it's something that I've been contemplating lately, actually doing <clears throat> a limited series of prints of some of my favorite things. But I don't want to host them on some other website. I, would, I was thinking of maybe doing my own thing and then they'd be a bit more expensive, but I would actually physically go to the printers and print them myself and I would know you get like a perfect uh, thing. Yeah, this is actually probably the best one to show you the technique. You see just the crazy amount of detail that's in there, which on Instagram and Twitter and stuff, it gets lost a little bit. I don't know, I just like looking at them <clears throat> close up. Even this is like a background is interesting. I'm experimenting with doing different things with the eyes and seeing what it looks like but yeah this is probably like this little section here and i have that a lot with a lot of my renders probably like one of my favorite parts just because i really like the texture and the um the feel that it has so there we go but with that said let's bust open that first one and uh and go from there and uh before i get in maybe just quick few questions 
So, um, hello, everybody says hello. Hello from Germany. Hello, Peter. Hello from Belgium. <laughs> Blender 218 Beta, does it crash that much? It's gotten a lot better. Um, in the beginning, it was obviously very crash prone. Nowadays, it's better and better. It still disappears every now and then, just when you think everything's sort of okay. And I've noticed that some files from the earlier part of the beta and the alpha don't seem to open 100% correctly anymore. And it's super, super, super important that any files that you make, that you consider them unopenable afterwards, I doubt they'll all be, but I've noticed some of them don't open properly and throw your preferences away every week, every couple days. Um, testing 2.8, it's a bit of a job because you're just kind of making sure that whenever you're testing stuff, you, you don't have old preferences stuck in there. I've noticed that certain modifiers don't work didn't work like recently there was a big update to the bevel modifier and I had a build from a few days before and still didn't work um, so I threw out my preferences and everything was working again <clears throat> so before you do a bug report very very important that you make sure you're starting with a fresh install <clears throat> there we go uh, little detail okay so everybody's just uh, enjoying it that's really cool is that the tissue add-on thing no this is all just straight modifiers so I'll try and show you the process from start to finish. Um, so I'll start with a bit of first bit of good news before I actually dive in there. And this thing, so some most of you know that I use the old Manuel Bastoni lab quite a bit. Now MB lab is um, been ported, it's on GitHub. And the best part is it's been ported to 2.8. So they've added stuff to it and it's, it's working in 2.8. So that's really, really great. And then for some of the some of the other ones, I used um, go to the Blender Market because I want to give everybody credit here because um, it's not just all me. Obviously, the the human what was I going to say the human uh, meshes are coming from somewhere. And the other one is called the Sculptor's Toolbox. The base message uh, base meshes by Jim Moran, and these are really nice. And these were made in 2.79 though. So I've been using just single frames Alembic to use that one and then export it to 2.8 because when I import this one or open it in 2.8, I've noticed that the rig is a little funky and there it's just two meshes. It's a male and a female, but they have a different pattern to them. So I don't know if I can show this. Actually, I'll just show it in Blender. But there you know, there you go anyway. Um, I would highly recommend taking a look at those if you're into sculpting at all or other things. So I just posed them in 2.79, at least this one, and then brought them back in. So let's see, this is two, so turn off three for a sec. And you can see where I started, but mostly as well, oh, that's right, this was still different in the older versions. So I'm gonna do it like this, and then turn on wireframe, it's a little bit better. But as you can see, they're not optimized for animation, but they're optimized for sculpting, which means they have slightly different pattern than the um, MB Lab meshes, which is really cool. Um, so, there we go. So what did I do first? What are my first steps? I'm gonna turn this off really quick. So I started out with just a regular, and this can get a little bit slow, just a regular mesh. And um, I had some just, where we go, come on. Yeah, this takes a little while because it's all still Boolean and everything, I should turn everything off. So I just started off with some meta balls and uh, let's see if I can turn this one off as well. So just very basic, which I put on the face and just kind of moved around and whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, ended up just displacing them just to control the shape a little bit. So I just use a displace um, just to push it out, give it maybe a little bit more and then remesh it. And then by doing that, I had a good base mesh. I'm gonna turn this one off or actually I'm gonna set it to wire maybe so you can see. And I'm still finding my way around 2.8 sometimes where certain things are and like getting used to things. But um, come on, turn this back on. You can see it's fairly slow, but now you can see exactly what I'm doing. So I'm using these remeshed meta balls to, um, to Boolean out some stuff. And you might notice this one, I think I only did one layer of remeshing. Um, unless I go to the second one now, because you'll see there's a second set of meta balls. And this one, compared to the other one, has just got the remesh pumped up a little bit higher. So that means 
Uh, the first one has a depth of, I think, six, and this one a depth of seven. And the reason I did it twice is because I wanted to get a slightly more interesting look. So now we have these Booleans that have multiple sort of layers to them. So rather than just having one size of voxels, I guess, um, you have two sizes of voxels. And I, I just wanted to see what happened if I Boolean things more than once. And I can definitely tell you there's a lot of like jiggling around of the shape, just moving it ever so slightly to get the Boolean not to freak out and to get it to close for the most part. As you'll see on some of the other meshes that um, it's not 100% closed and I had to cheat a little and close it up afterwards. But when you look at this, it looks really nice. It's interesting. And uh, obviously I've applied all the modifiers on this one. I just made a copy before I started with everything else. So with that done, I'll uh, turn on the final one and just turn off all the modifiers and then go through the steps so you can see what's going on. So this last uh, adaptive subdivision didn't work. I already had way too many polygons and I cut off the mesh as well. I always do this once I have my camera view set. I always cut off the mesh sort of a little bit further than I need to so I can still have flexibility if I want to move this camera around or whatever. I can still mess around with it or want to pull back a little bit and give it a little bit more space, do something like this maybe. Um, I can still do that, but at the same time, it's a more optimized mesh. So let's uh, go back to the old camera point of view. And this gets a little slow sometimes, it's okay. And let's actually just look at the mesh a little bit closer up. And I'm leaving the wireframe on so you can see exactly what I'm trying to do with the geometry. So um, this trick I've used so many times at this point, it's like an integral part of my workflow. So all, what, all that this does is use a texture for weight painting. So let's see at this one. So if you look at the texture here, um, it's a cell noise texture. Um, if I were to change this, it's not gonna update immediately because of bugs in 2.8 that uh, I still need to file a bug report for. Uh, similar to what was happening with the displacement textures. Basically, I'm using this cell noise texture to generate a vertex map, um, so I don't have to do it manually. Uh, on some of the other ones, I painted them in manually just so you see what the effect would be. But once I have that map, this setup, there's a quick tip um, in on my channel that explains exactly how to set this up, so I'm not gonna go over it again. Um, but once I had that set up, that's open up all these modifiers here so you can see exactly what's going on. I'm gonna close this one. Just, you know, this first one is to have this mask. So we'll go from there, go back to object mode. So first thing I'm gonna do is decimate it, but I'm gonna use this first mask. And this is where the fun starts, uh, depending on the ratio. So if I turn the ratio up again, it won't decimate quite as much. And once you put in a mask, um, the numbers tend to get fairly high. So we could even have multiple layered masks. Like for example, I could do this and then put in a different mask, which I think I even did. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and then decimate it again. So I think this is at 0 0.01. So just to keep it at the same thing. So then I get all these different parts that you saw with this texture. Uh, you see the way it uh, decimates, and I really like this effect. I'm a big fan of just completely destroying polygons, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I like it. So here we look at the second vertex weight, and this is put into mask two. So this has also a cell noise um, based distorted noise, or yeah, cell noise in it. I really like these cell noises because you get these really technical patterns. Um, but we'll have a look at what that does to mask two once I've put it in there. So let's see if we go in here. This is mask two. So this is just a different one. And you want to have a little bit of contrast in there. So now when I go back to object mode, um, and I'll answer some questions in a bit. I know I'm going fairly quick, but I want to be able to show everything uh, I can show tonight and then answer a little bit of questions after. So again, with that second mask enabled, I'm gonna close that first decimate and that second mask and enable it again, and we destroy it even more. But now because my ratio is a little bit higher, I get slightly smaller polygons rather than these really big messed up distortions. And that's the stuff I really like, uh, what I was trying to um, figure out, I guess, with these projects. So a lot of the series of renders that I do, I'll have one core idea to see 
how can I combine A with B or whatever? And with this, it was like, how is it possible to layer some of these effects up into a point like from bullying this, bullying the same thing twice with sort of a similar shape but higher density to layering these masks and seeing how many times I can decimate a model before it becomes just a hot mess. And um, yeah, I, for me at least it worked. I liked what, uh, what the results were. So we'll go from there. So second layer of decimation. So we see the big ones, we see the small ones. And uh, then it starts the wireframe. And a cool thing about the wireframe is you can also set it up to only use the mask. So I use the first mask to set the wireframe, um, but I inverted it. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to try and keep it um, a little bit more on the eyes, I guess. And all of this is experimenting. It's not like I went in and I was like, all right, put the mask, invert it. I just I put on a wireframe, saw what happened. Um, threw the mask in, saw what happened, realized I wanted to have more of the wireframe present on the face rather than on the uh, distorted stuff. <clears throat> and you can see, you know, it didn't have that much of an effect, even though if I throw away the mask, we'll see what happens. And it gets pretty slow. So I use it here mainly to control the size of the polygons. So it gives it just a bit more of an interesting effect. Um, let's see if we go over to rendered. This might take a little while. And we're there modifier wise. I'm going to turn off the overlays as well. Um, and now it's a case of shading it and, and doing that, um, which we can have a look at very quick. But yeah, let's see if I can uh, actually, let's do it like this and split it up. Uh, like I said, still getting used to some of the controls. It's not going to be super fast. These took a lot of um, a lot of samples to render as well, so they were kind of a pain in the butt. But it's okay. They're just stills, so with stills, it doesn't really matter that much. So I have a bunch of materials here, and um, something that I forgot to say as well is if we go into edit mode real quick. Um, when I did those booleans, there's a good trick. Uh, if you boolean something, for example, I don't, I can't remember if it, it works in 2.79 as far as I know. I think it works here, but I had to select some stuff manually anyway, because I forgot to do it. But basically, if you boolean something and you want to have, let's say you want to take out those chunks and you want to have those selected once you go into this mesh, then if you have everything selected in the boolean object, um, if it's, I think it doesn't work because I remeshed it, but if you have it just as a mesh, um, without modifiers or anything and if you select everything in there and you deselect everything in your target mesh it will remember those selections so when you go back in after you've collapsed down the boolean then you'll have all these inner parts selected and you, and you don't have to do it uh, by hand which can be incredibly frustrating except for those a couple of tricks you know isn't there always so here you can see the first material is just assigned to all the external stuff the second material is assigned to all the internal stuff. The third material is assigned to the eyes, to the outside of the eyes. Then that's on the inside, and this last bit doesn't seem to be assigned to anything. So there we go. <laughs> very, uh, very efficient as usual, but um, yeah, but it works. So I'll just go over the materials very quickly because I think they're not that interesting. Um, I'm trying to figure out why this one is in there. Ah, something weird. Then again, I'm opening these in a newer version of 2.8, so it might be down to that as well. Um, so I think, I believe this is the main, yeah, main material. This is a, most of these are quite simple. Um, so I've just got this little texture and uh, actually I'll show you that texture. I have these patterns that I use and I'll open a window real quick so you can see textures, patterns. Let's scroll through these real quick. These are all patterns and I got them from, I think it's called Stencil Kit or Grunge Kit or something. I'll have a look, see if I can find it on, uh, on the Blender Market again. Oh, Blender 
plant the market. Uh, cancel market. Ah. Nope. I don't know if it's still on there even. That might be grunge kit. Yeah, I can't immediately see it. It was called stencil kit, which is really weird. Stencil kit. Uh, market. I'll search for it on Google just to up our chances. There we go. Ah, uh, it's not there anymore. Um, so that's unfortunate. I'll see if I can contact the guy to ask him if I can share these now. Um, I want to ask him before I share them. But these are all, they're all seamless textures and they're all just these random patterns and they're perfect for this kind of thing if you just want some grunge on something. So I think there's like 70 something in there. You can see they're all different ones and some of them more useful than others, um, but they work really well. So I really enjoy using them, throwing them in there. And uh, there we go. Let me close out real quick and go back to our shaders. So it's just one of those patterns. And what I'm doing here is interesting. Um, rather than using UVs, I'm using um, blended box mapping or triplanar mapping, whatever the well, you want to call it. Um, but basically what it does is, I'm going to turn off the wireframe here for a second. Um, as most of you know, <laughs> ah, interesting something going on with these shaders. There's a second layer somewhere I'm, I might be forgetting about. But anyway, what this does is, if I scale this back up again, is just project it from three sides and um, you can see here the texture coming through. So if I just do it like this, you're just projecting it. So you don't need any UVs, it's blended in between. You can play with this blend thing to have it blend sort of over the three different axes. And the way to set it up is using object co coordinates. You can use scale. So I think it was set to five or something. There we go. So here you actually see it working really well. And um, then you got to set up the projection over here. Normally it's flat for using UVs or whatever. And if you use box instead, you can then can also control the blend. And there you go. You don't have to unwrap or anything. You don't, you know, even a, and it just, it's just seamless. So using seamless textures with that works really, really well. And then it's just a case of, I believe, I used it in the specular map and the roughness map and just tweaked it a little bit and then threw it in the bump map as well just to be, um, just to give it that little bit of, a little bit of extra grunge and a little bit extra detail that, once again, you don't really see on Instagram, but I know it's there. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm, uh, I'm making these for me <laughs> and not really for anybody else. So, um, Obviously, I do like that people enjoy them, uh, but um, for the most part, I just have fun with them. And the interior material, yeah, I could go over all these materials, but I don't really see the point. I would I want, rather want to get to the other ones and sort of some of the workflows of those. Well, let's see. This is just a, a white material with... Uh, the thing I guess is interesting about this one is the Voronoi texture has been updated in 2.8 and it has new patterns in it. So here you can see those patterns hard at work. Um, again, object, just whatever, um, thrown together. When you're working with these meshes and everything's all messed up already to begin with, it doesn't really that make, make that much of a difference. And the base shader is a very simple metallic shader. Um, doesn't really have much to it. And then some emission in there just to give it a little bit extra. And then usually what I'll do is if you look at these materials, they're for the eyes. So just give the eyes a slightly different color. So there's some blue in there, although it's almost completely invisible in the final render. Um, but I found just by accenting them just a tiny, tiny bit and taking away the rest of the eye, uh, the whites of the eye, either darkening them down or doing something else with them, you just get that instant still a human feeling even though this is a completely distorted nonsensical image almost so uh, again this is the blue for the eyes um, nothing special just high transmission with some clear coats so very 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 yeah shiny i guess and then uh, this was the base material that i said earlier so nothing 
amazing. Oh, and I think what happened is, that's right, the reason why the materials are set up the way they are is I've got this wireframe and I've offset the material and the original underlying mesh is actually transparent so you can see through the mesh here so you can see sort of the insides of the mesh there and then um, use the shader just on the wireframe so and I think that's about it for this one there's just a single light I've become a fan of especially if you're doing sort of very almost monochrome stuff and sure there's highlights in here with the uh, with the emission shader but I've just been having a lot of fun using only one or two lights and very sort of old-school uh, three-point lighting setups for some of it as well um, I used to use a lot of HDRIs way back when and now um, I don't know I feel things change you know you got to keep experimenting and keep going back to older techniques and see if you can do new stuff with them um, so with that being said, I think uh, that's that for this one. If there's any questions, now would be the time to ask them, and I'll answer whichever ones have been asked so far before I move on to the next one. <clears throat> so, uh, thanks for the preferences tip. Yeah, very, very important, like I said. Um, dark, dark Firefox for the win. Yeah, my whole Linux is set to dark, so it automatically adapts to it, which is really nice. Uh, duck, duck, go forever, yeah. <laughs> I usually use DuckDuckGo, but I found that sometimes with stuff that isn't online anymore, Google tends to have better uh, better results, unfortunately. And that's a really cool thing if you, on DuckDuckGo, if you type anything and you hit um, exclamation mark and then G, like spacebar, exclamation mark G behind it, it automatically searches on Google. If you do it with W, I believe, I believe it's wikipedia if you do it with t or tw it's twitter so you can there's a whole like with google there's all these cool tricks that you can do so it's a lot of fun um well people saying hello uh i'm not going to respond to each single one but hello everybody that said hello thank you for being here um you can have dark explorer with window blinds yeah linux so there you go um good to see you after so many days yeah thanks for being here again uh I got married in the meantime, so, you know, I had stuff to do. <laughs> um, is there, what's the difference between B-Mesh and Carve for the Boolean? Well, they removed Carve in 2.8. Um, I remember getting better results with Carve uh, with really weird meshes in 2.79. So, I can't remember what the reasoning was. I think this, I think Carve was the old way of doing things and B-Mesh was the new way of doing things. And it felt like B-Mesh was as stable as Carve, even though I have encountered weird situations <clears throat> where I found Carve to be more useful. Um, I did a lot of jiggling, like I said, with the Boolean to get it right, and I think with Carve it might have worked out a little bit better. Um, who knows? <clears throat> it's not in there anymore, so I'm not gonna, there's no use crying over spilt milk, as they say in English, so I'll just figure it out from here. Um, so let's see. What are your thoughts on Substance being acquired by Adobe? I think the internet has said enough about it at this point. I think it's good that Adobe is interested in 3D. Um, I think it's... We'll see what happens, because I, what I do feel is that Oligarithmic and their Substance products had one of the more fair business models where you could rent to own. It's something I really did like. Um, I'm not a huge fan of software subscriptions, but being able to own it at the end. So it'll be interesting to see if Adobe keeps that up. Also, if they're gonna make people download it through their Creative Cloud app, well, there's a Linux version of Substance. Is Creative Cloud the app just coming to Linux? We'll see with that, but yeah. We'll see. Um, I, don't, I don't really have much of an opinion about it. Like I said, we'll see, because they're only like, 3D app is called Dimension, and it's not really a 3D app at the moment. It's simple, and it does simple things, but we'll see. It's a different crowd um, that, there are, that those applications are aimed at, so we'll see. Uh, great to see another stream. Thank you. Thank you for being here again. Then those textures look great. Maybe the dude put them on Gumroad as they look like it gets get more sold there. Yeah, I don't know. Um, we'd have to figure it out. Like I said, I might actually contact him and um, or if somebody knows who he is, I can't remember who it was, uh, but I think through the Blender market, I might be able to contact him. I'd, I'll ask him. I mean, they're just some textures, so if he's willing to, I don't know, uh, what was I going to say? If he's willing to sell them, then fine. If he's willing to give them away, that would be even better. That'd be cool. So. 
there we go. Uh, there we go. Great, cool. If it's cool, Adobe must have swallowed too. We'll see. What image viewer do I use? Well, it's on Linux and it's called G Thumb. G Thumb. That's the name. And that's what it looks like. You can use it like this as well. But uh, I like it because the one of the nicest things about it, and it maybe sounds like something stupid, but you have just enough tools to like resize and crop and everything. So I don't have to open GIMP or Krita, which is really nice, actually. <laughs> Works really well. I don't know if it exists outside of Linux, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, so how am I so awesome? I don't know. I don't really think I'm that awesome. Uh, I just try stuff and stuff, good stuff comes out. So that's cool. Um, any experience with Svertok music nodes? No, I really want to start getting into those at some point. The only thing I've experienced with is animation nodes and that's for simple stuff, but yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah. So. Thank you for all the congratulations. <laughs> um, my wife is a writer, so she is not a blender head, but because she's also a um, creative person, we get along very well. So we understand when uh, we need to give each other a little bit of space here and there, which is also very nice. So she's very supportive of what I do and I am of what she does and it works for us. So that's cool. All right, I think I've got all the questions. So let's move on to the next one. Um, I had my stuff set up here. So I'm going to skip the one that came after this because it's essentially the same thing. The only thing I might have done different is paint the vertex map rather than use modifier. But for the most part, it's very, very similar. So I don't really see the point in opening that one. So let's close this one and it's all good. And here's the next one. So. It rendered very quickly, so not all the modifiers are actually on in this one. I'm gonna turn off the volumetrics for now because it's incredibly slow with it otherwise. Um, so this is just part of it, and I'll go through them again. So I'll turn on the wireframe once more, and here we see everything that's going on. So this one, as you can see by the um, by the pattern of the mesh is uh, the MB lab mesh. So I try to switch between them just to see if they give different results. Um, this one, I definitely had to jiggle the, the Boolean a little bit more, uh, as I remember. So I'm going to turn off the particles for a sec. Turn off those. There we go. I'm still getting used to the collections. Um, they're very powerful, but some stuff still a little bit buggy. So. Um, it's a bit of both, <laughs> let's put it that way. Let's see if I can maybe turn off the lights. Turn off the lights and the camera. And there we go, so it's a little bit clearer than all those black lines through. Um, all right, so let's go. These modifiers are already all turned off, so I have some particle modifiers. Okay, so I had, that's right, I thought I had a separate um, thing for particles, but I didn't. So let's go over those first, actually. They should be down here. There we go. So these are very simple. They're um, just some cubes. That's it. Just some transparent cubes, as far as I know. Uh, there's a mixed shader in there, so let's have a look at the shader. That's the compositing. Now you can cycle through. There we go. Um, so very simple shader as far as I know. Um, yeah, so the randomness, as usual, I use the random to put some emission in there so that that way some of them, oh, let's go back to the thing. So you won't see it on these, but if you look at the particles over here, some of them actually light up. So this is a trick that I use all the time. Um, and if you're doing anything with particles, it's great to, to have that one uh, and know what it does. So these are just cubes, different lengths, and scattered on the inside of a particle, or on the inside of the mesh. And you can see, uh, or you should be able to see, if I turn these off really quick, the particles, there we go. The particles are being emitted from, so it's the, insta, the instance, or inst.cubes collection. So you can grab the collection here. And down here you'll have a vertex group. 
So if I go and see, have a look at that vertex group, I believe, yeah, this one I hand painted in and I had to make sure um, was correct. So that was kind of a pain in the butt. Although I'll show you guys something really cool. And I was thinking of maybe even doing a weird shit episode on it in the near future. Um, but I'm just waiting for 2.8 to finish. Uh, but let's say, for example, you have all these particles or all these things and you forgot to make selection. If you hit shift G, um, you get this select similar. It's also up here, select similar. Um, and if you hit this one, and hit shift G and hit normal, for example, then it's going to select all the polygons with the same normal. So this way, even after I'd forgotten to maybe like select some of these, um, I could select the six different sides of the cubes. I don't know if I have all of them and then hit that and then just kind of take away some of the ones that weren't completely correct. So here you can see the Boolean actually messed up and there's this big patch of polygons. Uh, no, they're all stuck together, which have, if we dive into this mesh, they actually have that pattern, but the Boolean just couldn't handle it. And unfortunately did the same thing. So do the same thing here, used uh, metal balls to remesh and then multiple steps of bullying them, bullying them in. Um, that's that, and I don't know whether it's two, oh yeah. So usually, or not usually, sometimes I'll separate the eyes as well. So if I wanna do weird stuff to them um, separately or wanna keep them intact, and I believe in this case, they have very simple shading on them, but I wanted one of them to be a bit more powerful and contrasty with the rest, I kept them separate. So I'll turn those off for now as well. And we'll just look at this final mesh here. Um, whoop, there we go, solid, and there's the overlays. Um, where are we? Modifiers. First I'm gonna take a drink, because I am thirsty. I was talking. All right, so the particle systems, they're there. I'm just gonna turn them off for now. You don't have to worry about them. I feel like these icons switched around. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm going crazy, it doesn't matter. So again, with the Boolean mesh, um, let's start at the beginning. First one is subdividing it. And this is that little trick I wanted to show you guys. So rather than using the Catmull Clark subdivision, I'm using simple subdivisions. So that means I'm keeping the flat sort of polygons of the low poly mesh, but I'm subdividing them as a plane. And then this is the really cool trick, but I know all this, this well, sorry, I know why all this stuff is turned off because it's incredibly slow. Um, so once I turn this on, let's see. Oh, I'm displacing the inside, that's right, because I felt like the inside needed a bit more just weirdness to it and a little bit more, um, what do you want to call it? Detail, I guess. Um, and it just breaks it up a little bit more. And then again, the trick with the vertex group, uh, the, uh, the texture in the vertex weight edit, I think it is, oh, I keep forgetting the name always, modifier, and then you can use it as a mask because it's a vertex group, you can use it as a mask and other stuff. And then I have a first round of decimation, which is again, just using that mask. In this case, it's not called mask, but it was called destroy. So if we go back and have a look at it, then you see some parts taken out. And if you look at the way these are lined, again, our good old cell noise and cell noise. I don't think I'll ever get sick of using those. Um, it's just the way it is, I guess. <laughs> There's really not much to it. I believe I used it both as a texture or a smaller cell noise texture in here to get those patterns, so the little lines there, and then a bigger cell noise and cell noise distorted texture for the bigger patches here. It's just like straight lines and hard edges and that kind of thing, I guess. You know, it is what it is. But now, for the cool trick, um, because this thing created all these extra little bits and bobs uh, and created an interesting pattern, on top of that uh, simple subdivision surface, the um, the trick after this is planar decimation acts really funky with it. So because technically it's a straight plane, but because it has so many subdivisions, 
if you put the number down here and you can see how long it takes but if you put the number down really low you, it just freaks out and it doesn't really know what to do which is perfect because in this case we get all this super interesting geometry and um, yeah it just really really gives us funny and weird results and the uh, the added bonus is that these um, because I don't want them to be sort of the main I guess attraction but more the pattern and the face it simplifies these and then um, it's really cool because it does weird stuff to these as well and I believe if I turn on all boundaries it, a lot of this stuff disappears and I'm not going to do it because I think something's up with this uh, in the current beta I don't know what it is but I've had issues with it um, might be just me doing something though but um, yeah I'm gonna not touch it for now because everything's working <laughs> Or actually, let's do it. Let's live a little. It's going to take forever again. So this is why all these modifiers were turned off. So it just calculates it at render time. And there's still a bug with the subdivision surface as well, where it makes it... Oh, there we go. It looks like I might have not even clicked it, because this gives us even more interesting results. So, hmm. Should have done another one of these. But yeah, anyway. As usual, just messing with these, this planar subdivider, uh, planar subdivision is always really nice to do. And you could even have it like, you could even, what's the best way to uh, describe this? Use seams and other things to like keep certain edges and do other stuff. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. But I liked it without this. Um, I like those like jagged, uh, weird edges that it gives. And then as usual, this is. I don't know. I I feel like I'm always using the five or five or ten same modifiers, but if it works, it works, you know. Wire frame on top of that. Wait for about ten minutes. <laughs> I'm definitely feeling the limits at times of what I can do with Blender, some like with these modifiers, and I wonder, sometimes wonder if I have to incorporate other stuff into my work to really push it forward, but then. I'll find a new combo of stuff in Blender that I really like and then roll with that. So we'll see. Um, so there you go. And that's sort of the final mesh of that. And it looks kind of crazy as before. I closed it here, but you know, nobody's looking at the bottom. Who cares anyway? Um, and yeah, I just like the, the weird sort of crazy patterns it gives. But I feel like lately the detail, I've just been getting more detail out of some of these techniques. and. I feel like it's paying off and it looks looks pretty decent so and it takes a long time before it starts rendering because it has to load all that stuff in there we go and then that's it now this one does have a bit more things in it i think this is a three-point lighting setup so let's have a look at the lighting really quick because we didn't really look at it for the previous one and <clears throat> this one renders a little bit faster um, i can turn on these as well and turn on the particles just so we can see the whole thing. Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Time for another drink. I'll answer some questions in the meantime. So, thank you. Uh, I'm glad you were looking forward to my next stream. I'm glad you like my work, so thanks for being here. Your wallpaper, ooh, I'm, uh, I'm honored. Fun fact, I actually started with anything graphics-wise way, way, way back when, when I was a kid, because I wanted to make a wallpaper myself, a cool wallpaper, and it sort of all went crazy from there I guess and this is a long long time ago um, so somebody asks Garage from .net Academy have you messed with grease mess already if so what are your impressions I am probably one of the worst people to ask that on the planet because I cannot draw to save my life um, although I, I have to admit some of the tools that they seem to be implementing to make it a lot easier to get like nice shapes seem really interesting, but I haven't actually used it yet, so I can't really give you a fair impression, unfortunately. Um, so, hi, hi to you too. 
yes, best wishes and thank you for everything. <laughs> Same to you guys as well. Um, what a magnificent mesh. Yes, I thought so too. Looks like a robotic zombie pimp. Yes, indeed. Um, I actually wanted to make this one look sort of like a zombie. I can't remember what I was watching or playing, maybe playing a video game or something. I saw these zombies. Oh, no, I think I was looking at some old video, some old World of Warcraft video or something, and I remember, like, the undead had these weird things hanging out out of their face, and I thought it was an interesting look and see if I could replicate that with, like, my style of doing things. So. Um, hello, Mr. Midge, what's your name? Well, my name is just Midge, so I don't know. Um... I was wondering if you could make a rendering tutorial. The renders are pretty sexy. Well, I did one uh, in the Weird Shit series. It's called Ravenous Rendering. It's on my channel. And there's a lot of stuff in there that's still very relevant to uh, cycles in 2.8. So, yeah, go watch that one, I would say. Um, modifier nodes from Everything Nodes will be a game changer for all visual artists. <laughs> yes, but like the design document has been made this week. So we're still a very, very far way out. Um, I'm glad people get excited, but this stuff is going to take a long time to mature. And I'm excited to see what it's going to bring. So, yeah. Um, wow, how to procedurally make an Indian style pattern. An Indian style pattern. Like mandala type stuff? Or are we talking, yeah. I don't know, you could do a bunch of things. Um, one of the cool things about 2.8 is in the array mod, uh, sorry, in the mirror modifier, it now has a bisect option. So you could create a pattern and then mirror it and slice it in the middle and have it fit together perfectly and then mirror that one and then go completely crazy with it. Um, you can definitely do some very, very cool stuff. So I'd look into that. The mirror modifier and there was another one that had more options. Can't remember. But yeah, mirror modifier is going to be your best friend for that kind of thing. Mirror and array and then splitting stuff up. Here's some really cool stuff, I'm sure. So, um, let's see. Have you ever thought of adding stuff with kit bashing? I guess I could, but I feel with kit bashing, um, if I haven't made the assets myself, I'd want to make them myself basically first to begin with. But... I always get lazy and then I try, like I've tried a couple of times to make some stuff, but then I just get bored with it and then I just start distorting something with modifiers and it makes me happy, so that's kind of why I stick with it, I guess. Um, just makes me happy, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, so somebody said afternoon, evening. Um, so let's get into the lighting of this thing real quick and then, uh, so this is fun as well and, oh, did I just go back? No, there we go. This is fun in 2.8. We can actually see our overlays in uh, in the render, which is awesome for explaining stuff. So let's have a look. It's just three points of lighting. I'll turn all of them off and then on again one by one. So obviously we've got some lighting from the uh, from the particles from the emission shader, but that's just on the inside. It doesn't contribute that much to it. So usually what I'll do is I'll just start building up a look and all of this lighting stuff it's very important when you start lighting. I see a lot of people, they're like, they'll have a scene, they'll start putting lights in the scene and then just flop in a camera and that's it. It's really important that you look at both at the same time um, because depending on your camera view, you can, if you have a good camera view, this is one of the things that I personally set quite early and I'll, I'll tweak it or move it around a little bit if I have to. But um, I prefer sort of looking at yeah, looking at what my end result is and kind of going from there. So, um, let's see. So I have three lights. So one backlight, which is a little, a um, little more blue. Um, that's that accented the material very nice. And somebody was asking about the material, so I'll put in a neutral light in a sec. Then this is just a more whitish light, I believe. Oh no, this is actually quite pink. Um, so these together have a nice little contrast to them. So usually I'm using quite a bit of rim lighting. Um, I don't, yeah, for these ones especially, I found um, I wanted to have certain focal points and then not really have the lighting on there that much. Although I think this last one, yeah, just coming from the top, I just wanted these nice colors. So this is what I got. And I believe this shader is very metallic and reflects quite a bit. And because of that, uh, it's quite rough. So let's see if I can split the view here really quickly. 
and have a look at the shader at the same time so we can see exactly where all of this is coming from. So there we go. And this is my compositing and oh, dang it, that wasn't supposed to happen. So let's have a look and have a look at the different things. So you'll see I have different vertex groups and everything set up for all the different modifiers. So this is the base shader. So this is the main one. Um, if I turn off these lights and just put in, well, there's nothing in my world. So let's put in just a completely white shader so you can see um, the way it responds. So it is highly reflective. Um, and it's a very, very simple shader. It really doesn't do much, but it's the combo of the lighting and the shading together that really makes it shine. Um, pun intended, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I don't know why I'm opening that, but all it is, it's a shader that I'm using this Fresnel node. So we get this nice little fall off. Um, it's a little lighter here and darker here. So I can do multiple things with that. One of them is I can have a different sort of variation of blue on the edge and then more of a pink in the middle. And I'm using that as a base color. And just as I'm using it uh, for the base color, I need to turn my lights again. I'm using it to control, um, again, putting in a color ramp just to increase the contrast a little bit. And um, you can see what I'm doing is putting in the metallic slot. So if I take this out, it's a perfectly non-metallic shader and it doesn't do all that much. But just if you look at the rim here, and I might have just been peering at it, but it just gives you just that little bit more of an interesting feel of materials where it sort of blends from one to the other. And a lot of this stuff is pixel peeping for sure. I mean, like I said, half of the time, I'm sure people wouldn't even know the difference if I you know, posted one one day and posted one two days after. But yeah, it's just, I really like just trying to get the perfect sheen on it. And I think the reason I did this and it had an effect is because I was looking at the lights that I'd already set up. So that's what I'm trying to explain is like, it's all an amalgamation of all the stuff you're doing. It's not just good render settings. It's not just good lighting because people tend to focus on this one thing. They're like, oh, you know, these are the perfect render settings. I shouldn't touch them. Everything is, you know, this is how it works, whatever. Um, it's not that good render settings help, but you can have bad render settings and amazing lighting and you can still have interesting results. So that's something I tried to, you know, tell people. It's like, it's all the things at once that you need to need to have a look at. And then I believe that's that. I don't know what's missing. I feel like there's something about that. Oh yeah, I turned off the eyes, didn't I? There we go. So the eyes are in there. And usually I'll try to put the eyes, unless they're really pointing a, a certain direction and I want to have the viewer to have the idea that they're sort of looking off into the distance, I'm always gonna point the eyes at the camera because it makes it extra creepy <laughs> and extra weird and feels a lot more like they're, they're looking at you and there's interaction between you and what you're looking at. So, um, so that's it for that one, I think. Um, the other ones are quite similar. I don't really see the point in doing those. I think most of the techniques that I used, let me pull up the images actually and then we can look at them real quick. Um, so let's start with that second one. So this one has very similar techniques to the one before it. Um, then this, oh, this is the really big one. Then this one, again, as you can see, it's that same, I'll open the big one again so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Same pattern, um, only difference is this shader over here is more of a like jade, so it's see-through so transmission is cranked up all the way or almost all the way and it's very rough on the inside it's almost like a jade crystal glass looking thing and it offset really nice with the the gold of the um of the pattern and uh yeah here's a close-up i guess i was trying to take um it offsets really nice with gold the pattern and then again towards the end more of a more of a bluish to kind of contrast in there so um, usually what I'll do is I'll place the lights first, look for an interesting contrast, and then start playing with the colors. But it's not a given. It, you know, every everything is a little bit, um, yeah, uh, I guess a bit of an experimentation. So, And then this one, I guess it's just more of the same. Um, 
depends on how quickly I can get through the next thing that I might open this one. But it's, you see, it's the similar sort of looking pattern, same idea, same sort of zigzaggy stuff. Um, but usually as it goes, like with all of these renders, the first one is sort of rough and it's just a different color version of it. Um, and you see that like I have an idea and it's there and it looks cool. And then usually the second one is quite similar and it, the third one, I'm comfortable with the technique and I'm, I'm trying to push it further and do more stuff with it and then move on to there. These are taking a little while to load because they're huge, but um, then uh, as I get more comfortable with it, I'll s sort of do other stuff because like here I'm not even taking anything out of the mesh anymore. I'm just using that new pattern, whatever thing that I discovered. And then towards the end, I'll try and put everything that I learned on some of the other images that I did before onto one project and then just kind of really enjoy, you know, the, the amount of detail and to see how far I can push it before everything just starts crashing and gets really crazy and weird. So, um, yeah, this I like the way this guy looks at the camera. He's like, he doesn't trust you. So I really like that. And then, for example, with this as well, I had a better idea of what I wanted to do. So I wanted to take out one side of the face and really show the whole internal and then have the other side a bit more, um, I guess a bit more complete and then focus again on this part of the face and just have that as a good focal point where it's looking at you. And for example, here, a lot of it is cut out, but what I'll do a lot of the time as well is keep this line of the shoulders intact because then um, even if you look at it in a, at a very small thumbnail, it immediately reads as a human being as a portrait or something like that. Um, yeah, and these are all things I've picked up along the way doing a lot of these portraits. I Sometimes I feel like I'm repeating myself, but then whenever I do these, I, they just make me really happy. So I guess they're good to return to every now and then. All right, so let's go to the next thing and we'll close this one real quick. And this is the one that we'll be looking at now. So um, yeah, I've been using a different Linux distribution, uh, even more nerdy one, I guess. Um, just been getting into Linux a lot more and I like the, what it's teaching me about how computers work. And it's like getting to the nuts and bolts of things. And um, the one that I was using before, because Ubuntu was really fast. Um, this one is marginally faster. Technically it is. I can see here and there where it's faster, but like, I don't, I think most people wouldn't even notice or care. So. Again, when I say this stuff, take it with a huge nerdy grain of salt. <laughs> um, I think that's the best way to describe it. So um, I'll do a couple more questions and I'll get into this one. So have you ever thought of adding stuff to kid bashing? Yeah, I answered that one afternoon. What does the material on this guy look like in more neutral lighting? I think I went through that quite well. Am I planning to go to the video copilot live show? Depends. I actually haven't looked at tickets and dates and all that kind of stuff, so we'll see. Oh, Firefox is still open. No, it's here. Um, video Copilot Live. Okay, I don't know why it's so slow all of a sudden. I saw the opening titles though, they looked really cool. There's different ones, and I like. I like a lot of them. Is my internet freaking out because I'm streaming? So this one, not going to happen. This one, not going to happen because I got stuff to do. And these two are too far away, unfortunately. I have a lot on my plate. I didn't realize they were this close. Yeah, no, not going to be able to go. Love to go, but not going to be able to. Um, I'm speaking at FITC this year, which is in the middle of February, and I haven't even started my presentation yet, so there's a lot of work that needs to go in there. <laughs> um, so, and work, of course, need to work, need to, you know, make money to survive, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's unfortunate, but won't be able to go, and these are sold out anyway, so. Just out of curiosity, how many, how much are they? 25 bucks, that's really, really nice. So if you can go, I would definitely go. Who's the uh, who's the people that are coming? The Among, French Monkey. Yeah, I know most of these guys. Yeah, they're pretty cool dudes. He does cool stuff. 
Um, well, he does cool stuff as well. All these people do cool stuff, honestly. Different people. Dang, we should have done one in uh, in Antwerp. <laughs> Maybe we should email them. All right, so let's get into this one. Um, again, this is their logo. I thought the circle and like the circle and the and the other stuff around it was perfect for this kind of thing. Um, for my style of doing stuff and this ended up being like a big oh I don't want to do that I want to go full screen so I ended up rendering this one at 4k so this is like the full size of it um, if anybody wants this a background I shared it on Twitter I think you can just uh, download it and grab it um, so let's see how I got into doing this one and I am super glad that this is a 650 megabyte blender scene and I'm very glad I kept this cache around because this, as some of you might have already guessed, is a cloth simulation. And stuff has changed in 2.8, so it's gonna... Oh no, okay, cool, it still works. Nice, I'm gonna turn the logo off. So I had it lying down in the beginning um, just to do the cloth sim to make it a little bit easier. Um, on the cloth so I had flat ground and that's it so I have simplified versions for the logo so I just modeled the logo traced it it was you know nothing special um, and I have a couple of different forces in here so I have a noise and this is an animated noise actually just to uh, up the strength but there might be something weird going on with these keyframes yeah, there's something weird going on with these keyframes. Anyway, the strength animated down because I wanted to, the cloth to like pull together really quickly and then sort of rest and have enough space around the logo with like a weird sort of thing. And then um, the size animates down as well. So it starts with these big folds and then creates smaller ones on top. Um, it took me about a day to tweak all this stuff though because like I'm, I have no intention of making this look a lot easier than it is. Um, but the main thing for this mesh is in 2.8, there's a new cloth system. So it's the angular bending model. Previously, we only had the linear one and now we have the angular one and it gives way nicer folds. Like I'm not ripping on the old one because I did a lot of cool stuff um, with the old one. But um, the this new one is definitely, it, it feels a little bit faster as well, but it gets these really beautiful folds and weird things. And I'll just let the, the sim play really quickly. That might be interesting. So if you just play it, unfortunately it's not real time, but here you can see exactly what's happening. So there's a second force here in the middle, which is a pull force. So all that that is, is just a, there we go. So that's the, the whole sim. It's just a pull, which is a force force. So if you go into a force field, it's a force. It's like a filter filter, funny stuff. Um, and once again, it's just a strength. Um, yeah, I think there's keyframes missing here. I think from version to version, something weird is going on um, with the previous beta. So this is the kind of thing that I'm, I was talking about earlier. It just freaks out a little. Um, so from here, I have the strength, which is animated downwards towards the end. I think it's only all of these are animated within about 40 keyframes, I think, of the 100 frame sim. And you can see it, how it pulls in, and then sort of the pulling immediately stops. You can see around here where the end of the pull is. And then we get these nice, nice pattern. And, you know, it's just a case of using these kinds of tricks to do cool stuff with. Um, and the uh, cloth is a lot of fun in 2.8. Um, what I will say though is mess with the settings. I think by default, a lot of this stuff is, um, this is like set to like 15 and one or something and also 15. So what these do is the higher these values are, um, the more they're gonna resist doing certain things. So the higher, uh, you would think the higher the compression value is the more it would compress but it's actually the other way around which took me a little while to figure out which is like kind of backwards way of doing things but it's okay I think they should rename some of these to make it like and it makes sense that this is the stiffness and this would be the compression stiffness and the way this is damping and compression damping but yeah it took me a while to figure those out <laughs> sometimes reading the help file is very 
you know, <laughs> very good thing to do, let's put it that way. So by bringing all of these values down, you get almost this like plastic foil looking cloth. You can see the way this pulls together, for example. It doesn't really pull together like, um, like cotton or, or leather or maybe some like harder fabric does or more stiff fabric which to which the defaults are set i found the moment you start dropping these values down you get very weird freaky looking stuff that like pulls together really nicely and has all those foldy details which is really cool so i prefer um yeah i prefer that kind of look anyway and it's good to know it's good to experiment this stuff like the mass as well the lower the mass is the more floaty it's gonna be um the higher the mass is the more you know um yeah the more heavy the cloth is going to be, I guess. And then the air viscosity is basically, uh, you can look at it as how thick the air is. So that means um, how quickly it will float. So you can look at it as sort of a dampening force. Sometimes I'll just use a force, um, a dampening force by itself. But other than that, you know, it's just, um, yeah, it's just what it is. Um, so then I cached 100 frames. Um, actually, yeah, it's not going to work because the keyframes are all messed up. But um, I wanted to show you, it goes pretty quick. Now, other stuff that's really important, so I'm going to close these really quick, the physical properties. Uh, the quality steps, I usually keep these around default. I think the default's like five. I bump it up a little bit every now and then. But then the collision here as well is um, object collision is turned on, but you want to up this quality quite a bit if you're going to use self collision. So if self collision is off, it's going to self intersect and look really weird. You can also use that as an artistic effect, obviously, but I wanted the cloth to actually feel like it folds on itself and does a bunch of weird stuff. So turning on the self collision there, and I don't think I really messed with a lot of the default settings. They're, they work pretty well for most stuff. Um, then other things that are interesting about cloth is the pin group. So you can have a vertex group and that part of the cloth will just stay there. And you know, so you can have, for example, something, if you want something hanging down, but you want the edge to be stuck, um, let's say you're doing like, a, I don't know, whatever, just you have just a square and you want the cloth hanging down, then you can pin all the outer vertices and then it will just hang down by itself. And depending on how low you bring some of these physical properties values, um, it will really hang and really have these stretchy marks and stuff to them, which is really fun. So that's it for the cloth. Um, once I do sims, I usually just bake them down. So I'll just duplicate the object and then, or in this case, if you duplicate the cloth, it uses it, it loses its cache. So I'll just export it to like an OBJ or an Alembic or whatever. Um, and then I have one frame, or if I export the whole sequence to an Alembic, I have it cached on disk, which is really nice. And then you can start messing with it. Now, all this stuff is always on the ground and around the, you know, world center. So I know my logo is, um, if my logo is on the ground and the, um, the cloth is also on the ground, if I turn everything, it will still be okay relative to each other. If I put my logo down under the center of the, or under like the flat plane of the world zero, then if you turn it, you know, you might have to refit it and things. So yeah, simple tricks like that just make your life a lot easier and you don't have to think about, think about a lot of things, which is nice. Um, so. I have no idea what this is. It's part of that, which is weird because there's nothing there. So you can see I upped the uh, subdivisions quite a bit. And then on this one, I believe, yeah, there's a subdivision modifier for when it renders. Just um, for example, if you, if you look at these sort of little jagged edges on the cloth, the moment you add one subdivision on top of it, they'll disappear. So if I turn this back off again, you'll see this is what it looks like without. And just adding one subdivision in just really smooths everything out and makes it look really nice. So before I get into this one, I'll uh, very quickly show you how I model the dots, even though they're not really that interesting, I guess. Um, so just taking a dot and where are we? Modifiers, just using an array and in the array, there are control objects. So I'm using just an offset little thing. I mean, simple stuff. You start with one dot or one line of dots. And let's see if I can 
go back to the first one. So this is how I did the first one. I just modeled one row of dots and then with the array, uh, and this is control array, so the first one. So with that one, I spin them all around. And then this is the second one. And then I spin them all around with this other array. Um, same, exactly the same technique, just use an object offset. And you can spin them really nicely. Um, something that I find interesting when people uh, tend to say like, hey, there's uh, there's no way to do a radial array in Blender. And it's like, just use an extra object. But yeah, it's good. It's actually one of the things I really like about it. Um, and then the final, is this the final one? No. Okay. So, and then for the final one, I just combined them and then made the things a little bit smaller, um, the dots. So the way you would approach that, oh, I see even this one is an array um, that is just making some duplicates at the front of it. Um, and one of the fun things is if you set this to individual origins, um, you can do it in 2.79 as well, and you scale, you'll actually scale the size of the individual dots, and then you can control them afterwards still, which is really nice. Um, and then for these ones, you can see I took out all the overlapping dots. And even though it's not a perfect dot pattern, um, I knew because I was putting the logo over it. Um, so this is just without that cloth. Oh God, the subdivisions. I knew because I was going to put this glass thing around it just to get the, the, the logo around it. And then the dots in it, I knew you weren't be able to weren't going to be able to see them that perfectly. So even though the pattern doesn't match the mesh 100%, it doesn't really matter in the end, as you can see, uh, obviously. There you go. <laughs> so um, the dots are, oh, not wireframe, but solid. So the dots, let's have a look at their thing really quick. Actually, I'm going to do it like this. Once again, put in the camera view and just focus on this so we can see the rendered version. And then go in there. So this is the compositing again. I need to go to the dots. So the dots are yeah, um, just an emission. <laughs> two colors of emission because I wanted to mimic the colors of the logo. But what I did do, that's right. Um, how did I do this? Yes. If I go in here, that might be interesting. See, I want to do, yeah, this is the UV editor. So I got the dots selected. So what I did do is just put in, there we go. Put the UVs in like this, which seems kind of counterproductive, but that allows me to go in and just use a color ramp. So let me turn off the logo really quickly and turn off the overlays here. There we go. So this color ramp over here, I believe, controls. Uh, this is a different one. Yeah, this is for the randomness, so wrong color ramp. Let's go back. So because my UV layout is just laid out in two parts, I can just use a linear gradient texture and then no, because I haven't crossed the middle of the UV, then I can just use it like this. And then, you know, UVs don't have to be perfect to be useful. They're tools just like anything else. So use that and then the other one is um, I just have the dots but in the UV layout I've scaled them and that's I guess another use of those individual uh, so this is the random one if we go in here and then open this up really quickly so all of these dots it's just a frontal projection but I've scaled them down to zero again with individual origins <clears throat> and that basically means that your, the UV of each single dot is the size of a single pixel, or at least that's an easy way to remember it. So that means if I put in um, this map, for example, rather, no, ah, rendered, see, I'm still getting used to everything. <laughs> so rather than having it, if this was a normal UV, then you would have sort of different, 
like let me do this really quick so you can get an idea of what's going on so if this was a normal UV map then each individual dot would actually have um, sort of variation within it but because I'm scaling those down to a single pixel then they're just gonna pick up a single point of color which means you can get lights in one object with UVs to emit only a certain part of the image every time a single pixel so that way you can get randomness in there very quickly and then that ended up being the full shader where I just mix them together and I'm just using that randomness as a strength and you can see some of them are blocked out and some of them are a little bit darker than others and yeah that's a easy way of doing that kind of thing so that worked really well it's a simple trick but it works and yeah makes your life a lot easier so let's have a look at the logo shader this one again has what looks to be like a lot going on it's actually not that insane um, I've been using the the wave texture quite a bit lately because I've enjoyed using it I don't know why it's just updating mesh like this all the time let me turn off the dots Oh yes, because there is displacement in this one. So let us turn off the displacement for now. There we go. Um, so this is just basic wave texture, again, using object coordinates to get seamless mapping without UVs. But then what I'm doing is I'm grabbing this wave and manipulating it with the other one. So first thing I'm doing here with this one is subtract, subtracting 0.5 from it. And basically what that means is now all the values of the wave texture are instead of going from zero to one in, you know, texture in color space, you're going from minus 0.5 to 0.5. And I'm manipulating the UVs by using values. So UVs go from zero to one and above, but they also go in the minus. So what that means, for example, is if we'd skip this step, and it's just straight up um, manipulation. As you can see, if I'm gonna push these and I'm not looking at this one, am I? There we go. If I use this value to push them out, you can see it's only being pushed out in one direction, sort of like down there, or actually the thing is mirrored, so it's down there. I'm trying to figure out where it's going. Anyway, you'll, you see what I mean. The more I push it, it only pushes it in one direction. Um, not the band, but the uh, technical way of doing things. But if you see, look at the values here, then I'm getting regular distortion because it has a negative and a positive value. And that's why the subtract is in here. So you're not just pushing anything, everything in one direction, but you're pushing everything sort of out and distorting it rather than trying to push it away. And then I'm just using a, a vector. It's in converter, vector math, a vector add node to use this to add into the vector. Now this is a super hacky way of doing things and it's anything but correct, but it, if it gives me a more detailed result, because you could feed this one into another one, another one, you could just keep doing it and make like these insane nodes that have multiple textures in them. And yeah, you know, it's good fun. Maybe I should take the time to do one of those because it's been a while. I use this stuff a lot and I haven't really made a, a texture for it. So I think it was at like point six or whatever I can't remember what it was that ah, doesn't matter um, then again just mess with the colors a little bit and all I'm doing is it's in the transmission and without the lights in there you can't really see what's going on but because it's in the transmission uh, sorry in the roughness and it's just a shader with transmission you get this nice variation in the roughness of the shader and then at in the end as well I used it for displacement so when we look at the final result, this is why it takes a little while. If we go up really close, then you'll see it's actually all broken up and weird. And as you might have noticed, displacement now instantly previews in your viewport in 2.8, which is awesome. Um, but yeah, so you can see the edges aren't really perfect, but especially with glass, if you have any sort of bump map or displacement in it, it's crazy like the the effects and refractions and everything you get inside of it always looks really really nice and that's where you get this really dirty pattern on it and you can see if you look at the if you remember the what the texture actually looks like you can see those waves in there now and you know that's that
but it's not just the logo obviously the final thing is the cloth and again very similar trick again wave texture and wave texture so this is the base and it's distorting this one so this is what we get and from there on um, same technique so nothing special there and uh, from there on I'm just color ramping it but what I'm doing for this one is I'm putting part of the color ramp to switch between metallic and transmission so that's sort of just to boost the um, I guess what's the best way to put it to get even more weird reflective stuff in there so because some of the shading um, if we look at where the colors are here so this is going to be metallic this part over here around and then all the black here is going to be transmissive and if we look at it you can see that this does look a bit more metallic and this does look a bit more like gooey and almost um, like gummy bear like parts and that's because there's a lot of the metallic shader coming through here which is just reflecting and then this one is also refracting so by able it's really nice to have this little slot in the principle because you can mix different materials very quickly and get layered looks without actually having to make a huge node graph um, because outside of this little effect over here it's still just one shader um, going into it and then um, again to have more stuff we get the roughness and just re sort of color ramp that one for the roughness put it in there and um, that's the final result um, and again all of this stuff is just experimentation so final part is in the bump map so there's bump in there this one isn't subdivided um, because it's already really high poly I did the the cloth sim with a lot of polygons um, and yeah didn't really feel the need to do that just adding in the bump and sort of overdoing it because we already have all these really weird reflections and shader mixing going on um, you can get away with just using a bump map for even more detail so if I take that out this is it without the bump map so you'll see that metallic and um, transmissive stuff is sort of in there but not as much but the moment we add all the extra craziness of the bump in you see all this detail adds in so now we have basically three layers of stuff we have the original cloth sim with its folds we have um, the shaders mixing together to give more interesting and weird results and then uh, at the end of the day we have the bump which just really pushes a lot of that detail forward um, and again you could use displacement for this but depending on if you're gonna get this close then yeah maybe we'll start seeing it's a bump map but even then does it really matter with good lighting if it looks like it has relief then or relief or whatever you want to say um, then it doesn't really matter to me and you get all these more interesting results I think outside of that there's like maybe one or two lights yeah there's two area lights which um, they do a little bit but not that much uh, oh, actually they do a lot more than I thought so this is where I was towards the end of the project and I was kind of happy with it but I felt it was a little too empty even though it would work with the idea that it's a void and whatever but I just want a little bit more to make it a bit more powerful so um, ended up going with this area light over here um, just to bring out this side of everything and I believe that's the one in the back yeah so by putting it up if I bring this down you'll see this is where it all sort of falls apart and it looks really weird and awkward and you can see the bump map and the weirdness of the shading but because the lighting is very sort of indirect and from far away and only hitting the, the highlights you get this super crazy intricate pattern um, for free <laughs> without actually having to do a lot of displacement and craziness and then the second one was basically just to get a little bit more light on this side so I wanted to contrast sort of the highlight up here with the highlight down here and that's about it and you know the usual just a little bit of camera stuff in there um, I guess a little bit of depth of field and but not much just trying to keep it somewhat realistic and depending on the size of your scene you'll have a lot or a little if you use realistic values um, but yeah that's about it for that one I think um, I don't really, f yeah, I might open the other one real, real quick, but I don't think there's going to be that much to glean from it. So if you have any questions, ask them now. And uh, I'm going to take a, another sip of water because my throat is getting pretty, pretty rough. And I'll open the other one in the meantime. So.
Let's see. Oh. Yeah, this one takes a while to open even. Look at that gorgeous gray screen. So there we go, this is the final result. Ah, and here's a good, uh, I don't know, it's fine. I just have the cavity uh, over here in the overlays. I had the, sorry, not the overlays. In the shading, I had the cavity stuff enabled in the viewport, just so I could easily see where the ins and outs were of the mesh. So let's just quickly go over the modifier stack and then I'm sure we'll be able to leave it at that. All right, I'm not saying it's going to be very quick, but hey, a lot of decimation going on. And then I'll just answer the questions after that instead, and then we can wrap it up. So let's start at the beginning. Again, the trick with the vertex weight edit and putting in the, uh, the textures. If you're only joining us now, go look at the quick tip on my channel. Um, basically, using, once again, using a texture to control a vertex group. Then, this is where it might get interesting. Um, yeah, so you can also, you have the vertex weight edit, but you also have the vertex weight mix. So the cool thing is you can have different groups and then um, in this case, I'm gonna subtract it. So let's have a look if we can actually have a look at that group, which is mask. Make sure it's selected. I don't think it is. So mask, there we go. So this is the, the vertex group for the initial stuff. And here you can see what I did is I painted a second one called eyes. And then what I can do is because I figured out what I said in the beginning that I need to keep the eyes intact. I wanted to be like, all right, I don't, have to, I don't wanna have to worry about them. I just, at the beginning, wanna paint a group. So then I know um, what I can do is subtract them from any vertex group I might have. So this is really easy because then you can just highlight a couple of areas that you want to keep intact or you want to be able to focus on. And then with the vertex uh, weight mix, you can mix these together. So you can see I'm mixing mask with eyes and I'm setting it to subtract. So you have average difference, divide, multiply, add, replace. So you can do different things and you can have different ways of mixing them on top of that as well. And again, you could even use other vertex groups or texture mass to influence them. So Vertex groups or weights, vertex weights they're also called, are incredibly powerful and they depend on the amount of topology of your mesh, but because I usually have a lot of topology, um, yeah, I, uh, I can get away with using those and I don't have to use textures and other things to try and force it in there. Now the other thing that I hadn't talked about yet is you can see I used the same trick with the booleans, but this time what I did was I... Um, uh, decimated those first. So I don't know if it's a cube. No, is it? I don't know if it's still in there. Where is it? Mm, can't see it. Oh, because this one isn't on. Mm, so this is what I started with. I'm just going to turn these two off for a sec. Let's see. So those are the eyelashes, those are the insides, and this is the regular model. Hmm. I don't have any other stuff in here. I must have just thrown them out then. That's weird. I usually don't do that. But anyway, it, uh, it amounts to the same thing. The only thing I did differently is after the remesh, I decimated these to get a, a funky looking pattern. And again, you know, these looks really interesting. You could definitely do some cool stuff. Um, I did hand place a lot of these. I used the metal balls again, but I tried using a particle system for it, and then the mesh would freak out. And by hand placing this stuff, while it took a lot longer, I was able to get really nice control of where it happened. So I, was, I knew this was going to be my camera point of view, and I knew I wanted to have a lot like hewn out of the side here. So I was able to place them and get really cool, interesting looking. Uh, again, cool and interesting. That's all I seem to be saying, but hey, I guess. <laughs> Uh, that's what I think it is so 
Um, but yeah, but by having different mesh sizes and decimation and remesh sizes, you get these yeah funky patterns and go from there. So, um, so with those vertex groups set up, I think uh, there's another one. No. There's another one here, which does another subtraction. Okay, subtracted it twice for some reason. It's probably tired, didn't realize it was there. And then with that one being said, I now am able to displace. And usually these displacements, they're very, I think it's the face group. So add another group, which was, which came from I think texture. It's in there somewhere. That's weird. That's odd. I feel like there's a point missing in the workflow, but eh, it is what it is. Can't really do anything about it. So again, wow. Let's get my thing in order here. Overlays wireframe. So we can actually see the wires on the mesh. So the displacement is just to give it a little bit more of a wonky look. It was something I was experimenting with that is very basic, but it just, yeah, gives it more interesting, has a little bit more character to it, I guess. And then the first round of decimation, again, with these different masks that I was showing earlier, and because I subtracted the face, or the eyes one, sorry, I'm only getting it in places that I want. Um, then a second round of decimation, but, uh, a really cool one is the unsubdivide one. It can get a little slow, especially on a mesh like this. And I don't know if it did all that much, to be honest. Yeah, it just messed with the edges a little bit. So it's on there. It's super slow, but it doesn't really seem to be... I think it just takes away... Yeah, it just makes this mesh, this edge a little harder and takes away some of this stuff. So maybe not quite necessary, but eh, who cares? And then again, the last one... I was using the same trick by putting the angle limit of the planar decimation very low. You get a lot of like crazy noisy looking stuff. So I didn't do the simple subdivision before to keep the flat planes, but I found that if you mess with this angle limit and you keep it between like zero and two and three degrees, you get just the craziest, coolest looking uh, decimation going on. And it worked really nice. It worked out really nicely because a lot of this stuff the, uh, I guess the, the mesh was already broken up and decimated and you get a lot bigger lines and a lot more crazy things going on. But because this, these eyes have already been sort of kept intact, it's automatically a lot denser around there. And then when you look at the final render, it's nice because you have this really dense mesh and the eyes are the focal point and everything else sort of goes up and down from there and gets progressively less and less, um, how should I say this, detailed. And because the detail is in the part that I want people to look at, it just emphasizes it a little bit more. And then at the end of the day, the wireframe and it's slow, 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 slow. And then we'll look at the, the lighting very quickly, but the shaders are gonna be similar. Or we'll just have a very brief look at the shaders. So the skin, is that's the compositing again so the skin is a bit of transmission a bit of metallic and one of those patterns again that i was showing earlier and i'm using the um i painted a vertex color mask there we go so I painted a different one just to get a darkening around the eyes because i wanted to that's right i remember now i was experimenting with um trying to do like a, a Batman mask. And as you can see, there's darkness around the eyes here. So I used the vertex color mask for that. Once again, because I just wanted to paint it on, didn't want to have to deal with UVs and just use vertex colors instead. And you can use that in cycles as well, which is really nice. Um, then, sorry, looking at the other shaders, the inside is really complex. I don't know why. Okay, so let's pull it apart, I guess. So let's see. I guess I did spend, I spent a lot of time on this one, tweaking it and getting it to where it needed to be. So, oh yeah, actually it's not that complicated. So again, you see the same setup um, of the 
the coordinates being pumped into one and then doing this the multiply I didn't even subtract on this one I just added the vectors together and it's basically just a brick texture with a brick texture doing the same trick again in another brick texture and because of that you get these really weird looking shapes and forms and then on top of that I put in another brick texture um, and I don't think it was necessary to go this far but sometimes you just kind of go down the rabbit hole and if it looks good it looks good so um, and then this one is just a regular brick texture but because I'm multiplying it with the other ones I get the pattern that's shown here um, and then again just adding this m dot shader um, I think I've shared this a couple of times at this point it's on my FTP thing um, it's just a shader with dots. I created this a while ago uh, in 2.79 even, or 2.78 maybe. It's all it is, it's three wave textures. Um, yeah, unfortunately can't show it from here, but because the wave texture are basically straight um, gradient lines, if you multiply them together in the right way, you get dots and you get this sort of halftone looking pattern. And it's not perfect, but for this case, I just wanted to have a little bit of a breakup of the lines inside of it and get more of a like dotty technical looking pattern on top of it. And then the base shader is really simple. It's just a metallic shader set to gray with a roughness of 2.276. So there's really nothing special to the inside um, except for the, the kind of crazy amount of stuff that I'm doing here that isn't really necessary, I guess. And then for the wireframe, there's, uh, as I was saying earlier, simple shader again. So again, box, blended box, projecting those on. And um, using it for, let's see. Oh yeah, so here you can see that mask. If I just show it here, here you can actually see the color, but I, I Took it back a little bit with the color ramp but you can see it's a little bit darker than the other stuff and then this is being used again color ramped for the roughness in the shader and then this again for the little bump map i uh, i think i tried putting displacement on one of these at some point and after i was like getting into swap space and my computer just completely locking up i decided i was just going to use bump uh, bump maps instead so um, but it's just the all the different little bits and bobs of the the patterns and all the patterns on the patterns on the patterns and like that's the best I guess advice I could give people is just keep layering stuff like whenever you're looking at it and you feel like something is missing try and see if you can add another layer of things maybe if your shader is really simple see if you can bump like a, put in a little bump map or a pattern in there if your lighting is very flat see if you can maybe take away some of the lighting if it's overly lit it tends to get really flat or if it's too frontally lit like coming from the same point of the camera it tends to be too uh, too flat so use a lot of rim and backlighting and see where that gets you because it's a lot moodier obviously depending on the project if you need something else do something else but for this kind of thing um, it works out quite nicely so I'll turn off all the lights as well so you can see very quickly um, this obviously is the emission shader that I was showing earlier. So again, one light from the side, once again, um, one light from the back, just to give it that little bit of extra color, um, just to offset the rest of the colors. And uh, again, rim lighting works really nicely just to get the shape in there. And because if you thumbnail this, you can see it's a human head, it's a, it's a shape, that looks cool. So, um, and then a little trick here, the eyes, I wanted to have the eyes uh, be a little bit more visible. So I put two point lights just over here. And because they reflect the point lights in front of them here, you just get that little bit of highlight. So if I turn this off, you can see they're quite dark. And if you turn these on, yeah, you really get in the look there, um, which is a lot better. And again, I want it to connect with the person that is looking at it. If if it feels like that thing is looking at you, you're immediately a lot more engaged with the, with the image. So, um, but yeah, this is one of the series of images that I was definitely, I'm definitely very proud of just because most of them I really like. The, the first one, uh, the third one, and the, the last one, this one, I think this one might be my favorite together with the first one. And then the, the, 
what is it pinky purpley one I like as well but I don't know I just really this one just the pattern for me on this one just really really did it for me let's put it that way so I think that's it for these um, I'll show you one compositing setup very quickly because most of these are the same um, just so you can get an idea of some of the things I add to it but um, oh wow this one's a lot more complex mm, yes and no really um, I'm not gonna render it out now because it's gonna take a little while but basically this is a vignette um, which I put in quite early and then some glows and what I've been doing with these which was interesting if we look at the images I can maybe explain it just by looking at the image you can see how these have like this big glow around them basically I'm just using a glow in the compositor and then blurring the ever-living crap out of it which means you almost get this volumetric looking effect without actually having to render it the only one that had any volumetrics in it was this one just because I wanted the background to be a little bit lighter um, but again if you look at it, um, it looks okay on some of them. I, I could tone it down on some other ones, but um, but basically here you can see there's a big, basically all this stuff is glowing over here, but then because it's blurred out, you get this really big fringy color and over here as well, which is nice. Um, same with this one, you can see how the highlight is over on this side because it's just the regular compositor glow, but then blurred out and laid back on top over it. Um, so that's this bit. This is some weirdness with the colors just to be able to boost the um, the oranges, but that's very specific to this one. So what I'll do is I'll separate R, G, and B, and then um, this basically subtract green and blue from the red because I know this is orange, and it gives me a sort of a mask for this one so I can just boost that one. Um, yeah, I think I've explained that before even in the compositing thing and the weird shit stuff. And then basic color correction and just some sharpening and softening to get this effect when you look at it, at it from really close. I always want stuff to look like it could be shot with a camera. Um, so here you can see it's not 100% sharp and it sort of has that over sharpening effect that um, a DSLR does. Like I always try to make it look like it's like it was actually a camera. and. I had a funny comment from somebody recently. Um, they, they told me they had showed my work to someone and they'd showed these faces in particular. And that person had um, said something like, oh, wow, he must put a lot of time into photographing them after he sculpted them. <laughs> so if people actually think these are real, um, I'm impressed. Like, <laughs> I would think you could immediately pick it out. But I guess where we live in this little 3D bubble um, where we can pick it out easily. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that I'm able to fool somebody with these things into making them think they're actually real. Um, it's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, final questions and then I'm out of here. Well, not really, I'm still here but I'm turning off the camera. <laughs> um, so, What's a slideshow app called? Well, I'm on Linux and it's called Gthumb. So G and then thumb. Um, but yeah, it's quite nice. Then are the cloth presets still in 2.80? Yes, I believe so. So if I just make a new thing real quick. Um, yeah, I don't even have to subdivide or anything. If you go in here and you hit cloth, now when you see this little thing in 2.8, you have a bunch of presets. So they're now sort of integrated into the header, which makes them a little bit harder to find, but a lot easier to manage because you can move and add ones very easily from here, which is really cool. Um, it's been a while since the last stream. Thanks for spending some time for the, to share with the community. Yeah, I know it's been a while. Like I said, uh, I had other stuff to do, but I'm glad people enjoy these. Um, I feel like I repeat myself sometimes a little bit, which is why I don't do them a lot because if I do things that are similar, um, a couple of weeks in a row, then I don't really see the point in doing streams every every two weeks or every couple of weeks because I would just be saying the same thing, I find. But yeah, maybe it's just in my head, I guess. Um, so excellent. UV trick can be used for leaves, lights. Yep, exactly. You can use it for all kinds of things, which is really nice. Um, so Tim says, looks super cool. Thank you very much. Uh, could you quickly cut the metallic input for comparison? I think I did. I am guessing this is with the void render. So um, yeah, I did, didn't I? I think so. Yeah, you get a lot. The, there was less uh, less stuff in there. Um, 
So, hey, another great stream. Thank you very much. Good to see you again, Finn. <laughs> Slightly off topic, is there any magic trick I'm missing for looping hair dynamics? Or is hair, mesh, cloth, sim, loop the best option? Yes, so hair dynamics are... I've tried looping them before, and I found them to be impossible to loop because there's always just that little bit of different offset. So what I would try, what I tried, um, and maybe you have better results, but what I tried is have the animation of the object of the hair loop two or three times and have the sim run a couple of times on it. But even then, it's always off just a little bit because it's a simulation and that's really annoying. The only reason I'm able to loop like a particle simulation or even fluid sim with the particles is because basically you have a start and an end point and you can have them go around and, and start on top of the other ones and you don't really see the blending. But yeah, hair particles or hair dynamics, I haven't found a good way to loop them yet. So doing using a cloth sim with strips would probably be a better way to do it um, because then you can use the point cache trick, um, which I showed in the, the looping video. So um, do I optimize settings with glass and cycles for animations? Uh, yes, I have this glass shader um, that I have referred to a few times now in the Oh, wrong one, this one. In some of my videos, I need to find it though. Blender help. Blender docs. I don't know if I'll be able to find it this quick, but um, is it here? Maybe it's in here. wrong one I already clicked something but it's in and I like to show this every time because then people at least know where to find it so render cycles render I think it's in workflows maybe no cycles render optimizing renders maybe it's in here and then Glass and transparent shadows. Is it there? No. Oh yeah, this is the one. So it's in here. So basically, if you just replicate the setup, you can, I think you can do it with a principal shader. I haven't done it yet, but for glass shader, it's great because it doesn't have any sort of interaction. It just sort of exists and it will reflect on other things, but it doesn't really have any ref uh, how should I say this? It doesn't interact with the scene in other ways. So it renders really quickly and it tends to be not super noisy. So this little section optimizing renders in general is a really good one to have a look through because there's a lot of good stuff in there that you can, uh, yeah, you can learn about how cycles works internally. And it's very, uh, very good to just have a very quick read through it. Um, and to optimize any sort of fireflies and noise, your best bet is always, 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 always in cycles going to be the under the light paths, um, the clamping over here. I'm very happy that the default settings now come with clamping of indirect light because it takes away a lot of the fireflies already. And if you still have them, for example, if you have a lot of emission shaders that are really like super bright, then you might have to clamp the direct light as well. And don't overdo it. Um, test with values. There's a super scientific way of doing it, which you can do if you want to, and there's an interesting article somewhere, I've talked about it before, but if you look it up, um, Blender clamping the right way or something like that, you'll find it. Um, it's crazy, you can get super deep into it, but these are good things to do. Just don't clamp them down too much. Remember, this is the maximum intensity a light can have in your scene. So if you have super high values and you clamp it down, some of that light will get lost. So you might get a different result. I talk about this in my shading, no, either the shading shenanigans or the ravenous rendering episode of weird shit. Um, so have a look at that because I explain it and show some uh, different results with it so you can get an idea of what's going on. So, um, If you use a simple subdivide and displace positively, all those edges will be cuts. Yeah, you can do great once you have the... Oh, I was typing Firefox in here. So once you have... Um, once you get the idea of how it all works, then you start thinking with your mesh in terms of volume shape rather than uh, topology, which is really fun because then it gets super interesting. Um, 
the pattern looks really good and sells the effect. Yeah, thank you. I, I think it does too. Um, so it looks amazing. Thank you very much. Um, any good ways of quickly and efficiently managing assets such as pre-made materials model just speed up the creative process. I always end up digging through my old project blend files for those. Um, yeah, for example, uh, I have in my projects here, I have some HDRIs that I'd like to use if I'm not pulling them from the Blender Cloud. I have some models like sculpt based meshes I was talking about just set up. And I have one folder with like all my projects and like personal projects going on or active ones and I archive them on a, on a server after that. But I just have different things like I have little node groups that I've found on forums and in other places over the years that I can use. Um, and textures as well, you've seen some textures, stuff that I've downloaded or bought or whatever and then those uh, little patterns I was talking about. So I just have folders with them there so I can just quickly pick them out. And same with the shader library here, it's just one, yeah, it's just one thing with shaders, but if I go to F3, you can see, well, actually, I have to make an object first. Uh, let's add a material to this thing. I don't know if it's going to work, but here I have all these groups. And if you look at this group, you can, in Blender 2.79, it's the F button. And in this one, the icon is still changing around. But if you enable this, it's going to save those even if they're not attached to anything. So this is basically an empty scene, but it's got all those node groups saved in. So then I just append it from from these things and I have them in a place where I can find them really easy. So that's nice. I mean, that's the best way of doing it so far. Um, some people make an asset library. I know of people that work uh, in different industries that um, have like a full asset library set up and then you can have plugins and you can just drag and drop. I think there's a, Chocofer has an add-on. I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. But um, I think they have one and there's other ones as well. I think there's one being worked on. So there, there are ways of doing it. Um, just dig into it and find the one that you like. So, um, Can I post a link? Is there is a Blender artist post about more realistic depth of field dimensions? Yes, of course, you can post any link you want. I don't mind. Um, as long as you, you know, you're not sending people to sketchy websites, all good. Um, kind of a tedious process as far as I know Blender doesn't have anything like quick access asset library. There is, there is, there are add-ons for it. Look for them and usually the way they work is they have, they need you to have, um, what was I going to say, a specific folder structure but then you can have a folder on like a network drive or a local drive with everything in there and you can just drag and drop in there. You know what, we'll have a look at the Shokofor website very quickly to see if it's on there. Uh, so at least is it .com? I think so. Come on. What is up with my internet? Jesus, get blasted with the, the light here. Come on, just load. I hate all these newfangled websites with all these loading and extra things. And I do know that I sound like an old man right now. Maybe I'm just blocking too much stuff for the website to to properly work. Oh no, there we go. Um, if shaders, maybe he just showed something in the. There is a there is a talk from this year's from last year's so 2018 the the last one but last year's Blender conference. That's their model manager. Is that the one? God, this is a slow website. Anyway. Um, but it might just be me. How would you animate using the mesh masking technique on a high resolution mesh? Oh, that's very easy, actually. Um, so let's say we have, I'll show it very quickly with just on this mesh though. It's a little bit faster. Let's see, we have this here and I'll add in the, uh, throw out the cloth because we don't need that. And I'll add in the vertex weight edit Add in the mask group, and then we can go back to that website in a sec. Group, group. So I'm just setting it up. But like again, I'm not going to go through the whole process. Just look at the quick tip, and that's the easier way to do it. So here you have the texture mask, and I'm just going to show it with a mask modifier, um, so you can see exactly what's going on. So we if we have, and this is because of Blender 2.8 that it's not uh, updating properly. It's down to Blender, not down to other stuff. 
Um, because of these, because you're using a texture, you can always use an object for the coordinates. So if I add in just an empty here and set that to use that, then we can move around the empty and you can actually see it happening in real time. Now on super dense meshes, it's gonna get super slow. So don't you know expect wonders, but um, you can do cool stuff and you can actually see that texture exactly the way it looks. And uh, yeah, let's go back. Yep, there's a model manager. It looks like that's what you're looking for. So have a look at it. It might be what you're looking for. And uh, yeah, I don't know if it's free. Looks like it. Yeah, oh, you got to log in. Yeah, so it's free, but yeah, it's free. That's cool. All right. <clears throat> well, with that said, I think we're done. We're almost at two hours. <laughs> My voice is starting to crack a little bit and I'm getting real thirsty. So um, yeah. Thanks everybody for joining. I hope it was uh, was interesting. Um, depending on my schedule and if there's cool stuff that I've been doing lately, I'll try and stream a little bit more. But once again, if I feel like I'm going to repeat myself, there's no point. The weird shit stuff will be coming back again. I've said this before, but I'm just waiting for 2.8 to be finished um, or released at least. Um, so there's not going to be any major changes because I feel like there's still stuff changing and. Yeah, it's important that if I record a tutorial that at least it makes sense for the people that watch it. Um, and again, if I want to use some of these techniques, you saw the way, like if I do this now, it doesn't update yet and normally it should. So if I have to explain that it's not working because it's the beta version or whatever, I feel that takes away from the tutorial and that's not fun. All right, so that being said, thank you all again for being here. I hope it was interesting and um, yeah, if you have any questions feel free to hit me up online and we'll see you next time all right bye guys and girls obviously if there are any girls watching this <laughs> bye.